Welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us for the second installment of our Atomic Insights webinar series. Um, my name is Sean, I'm Growth Director here at Reboot. Um, for those that aren't familiar, uh, Reboot is a search-led marketing agency. We specialize in PR, SEO, paid and, and content strategy. Naturally, you know, these links have become more and more important uh, over the years in, you know, in the eyes of Google. We've specialized as an agency into earning links through digital PR. So it's become a bit of a forte here and yeah, really excited to be talking to a nice range of guests on today's webinar um, about you know, offsite SEO. Um, I hope people have had a really positive start to 2024 in spite of the shocking weather recently. Um, we've had some yeah, really interesting conversations with clients and industry partners in recent weeks. It feels like there's a lot in store for SEOs, for marketers and business leaders this year. Um, obviously, we had a bit of a wild run at the end of 2023 with Google updates. There's, there's a lot coming up in the news cycle this year with elections both sides of the pond, AI continuing to become more and more you know, embedded in people's day to day. So lots of, lots of change, lots of opportunity. Um, Reboot naturally being well known for experimentation, um, you know, we're always looking to kind of keep our finger on the pulse in the SEO industry. Um, and late last year, you know, rather than experiment per se, we ran um, quite an ambitious study into the e-commerce SEO space. Um, our aim really was to look at challenger brands, businesses that are really challenging those giants of industry, to understand those SEO strategies that the top brands are using, the brands that are ranking top of the SERPs in those competitive verticals and what they were doing to, to gain success. So in December, we hosted our first Challenging Giants webinar. Um, we took a deep dive into on-site SEO findings from the study. Today, we're looking at off-site SEO and specifically digital PR-led link building. So really hoping to provide the guests on our webinar today with some useful snippets from the research, but maybe more importantly, actually looking at tangible takeaways, tips that you can take away and implement immediately into your campaigns. Um, of course, a lot, a lot goes into digital PR strategy, you know, ideation, data and research, press strategy, right through to outreach. Um, that's not to mention, obviously, the SEO planning up front to inform those target pages, inform those types of links that we all want to earn and that we need to earn to, to drive SEO growth. Um, you know, a reboot, we've, we've refined processes over you know, the well, last 12 years, really, since, since we formed. You know, we've built a very large in-house data team to supplement that PR activity, evolving those outreach tactics with the changing media landscape and constantly having to adapt to, to Google and the way that we interact with publishers online. So today, you know, as well as those data insights from the study, um, we'll hope to provide you guys with a, a sneak peek into successful methods, processes that we're using every day to earn links at scale, ultimately drive growth for your business. Um, and leading us through this morning, we have Emily Barrington, who's an SEO manager here at Reboot, who actually led on the, the research project. And then James Oliver as well, one of our very experienced account directors, who has a wealth of knowledge in digital PR within the e-commerce space. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I'll hand over to Emily. Awesome, thanks, Sean. Um, so today what we're going to be covering is we're going to have a quick run through of the methodology behind our um, big data e-commerce study and then I'll be passing over to James who's going to run you through some of the types of digital PR campaigns that we were seeing um, within the e-commerce space, um, tips on tricks and how to have maximised your success during your campaigns and then we'll also touch base on the outreach process as well um, before moving on to a Q&A. So if you do have any questions for us feel free to leave them in the comments. They are being monitored um, and we'll make sure to cover as many as we can at the end. Um, so to quickly run you through our methodology, um, we actually analysed 24,681 e-commerce domains um, across six different markets. Um, we used a variety of different APIs and our amazing in-house data team um, to measure these sites against 60 different metrics that we know are part of Google's ranking algorithm. Um, that allowed us to get a very top level overview of um, how optimized these websites were at kind of a, a large, medium and small range, um, as well as the different SEO strategies that e-commerce brands were focusing on, um, both at kind of a, a, a large, small and medium, but also at a market level as well. Um, we then manually audited 150 of these websites to gain even more in-depth insights. There were some SEO checks that we wanted to do that we just couldn't automate in a way that was going to give us very um, accurate data. Um, and this actually included auditing over 2 million backlinks that these 150 domains um, received. We really wanted to focus our analysis on the backlinks because 
as Sean kind of mentioned on, it is heavily weighted within Google's ranking algorithm. Um, I know that Google has come out in the last six months and said that rank, uh, links aren't in the top three ranking factors. Um, but we just have to categorically disagree on that um, because we're seeing it time and time again where we're building these great links into these sites and, and the sites are responding really well, really quickly to the links that we're building and we're seeing ranking increases. Um, so from, from what we see from the day-to-day -day of the impact of these campaigns on our clients, you know, we, we do see it's one of the most influential ranking factors um, on top of obviously a content and tech SEO strategy as well. Um, so the way that we actually analyzed these 2 million backlinks was we automated an Excel sheet to pull out um, common phrases and terminology that we found within the anchor text and surrounding text of different PR campaigns. So if we're looking at data led, it could be um, according to or a survey or a study um, that kind of manually segmented a lot of the links that we were putting into the sheet. And then we could then manually go through and triple check and sense check the data. So some of the tools that we use to do this analysis included Built With, who's where we got our initial um, seed list of domains that we then went through, um, Python, Screaming Frog, Lighthouse, SEMrush, Ahrefs, um, Majestic, which we cross reference with the Ahrefs data of the links that we got. So we could then also tie in kind of typical trust flow, um, citation flow, um, primary relevancy, and then also Excel as well. And we also just wanted to include kind of some examples of the e-commerce brands that we analysed at that manual level. So these are all kind of people that we've considered their backlink profile for during this analysis. Um, the list is much longer than this, but it includes, you know, B&Q, Next, Mattress Online, um, all the way down to kind of smaller um, brands such as like Ask for Screens and Body Socks as well. So today we're going to essentially tie that all up for you and run through what we learned from the link side of our analysis, um, which primarily did focus on digital PR. It's something that we're seeing very widely adopted um, and has kind of contributed towards a lot of the accelerated growth that we've seen of some of the domains um, that we analysed. So I'm going to hand over to James uh, to run you through that today. Thank you, Emily. So as Emily mentioned, the white paper findings highlighted the importance of driving those high authority links for e-commerce brands but in today's session we wanted to delve in a little deep a little bit deeper to see just how they've been securing those links and the type of campaigns that have been run by some of these large e-commerce brands all the way down to the small and medium in order to see how they've brought those links in at scale so one of the first things that we noticed was that data-led digital pr was something that was very prevalent in all the links that were built through from digital PR activity. So the data-driven PR campaigns tend to perform well, and these can take into anything from a survey through an analysis of third-party data, or even a brand's own data in order to highlight trends within the market. And it's clearly a popular activity because it was being used by over half of the e-commerce uh, domains analyzed, and that was ranging across those different areas. So some would be doing surveys, someone would be using own data, and someone would be bringing in analysis of authoritative data from third party sources. When we dug into the domain rating of all the links gained for this kind of data led digital PR, it was around 44. And this is because it encompasses a wide range of publications. If you are putting together a digital PR story that has the relevance and strong data to it, it can be of interest to a wide range of publications. So these are some of the publications uh, that the brands have been able to gain links from. It's not an exhaustive list. It goes all the way from your top tier nationals like the BBC, Mail Online, Independent, through shareables like Yahoo, um, lifestyle publications like Cosmo, Vogue, Glamour, housing publications, regionals, but also those niche trade publications as well, which will vary from brand to brand, but still have that high relevance that comes through for them. So as we took an analysis of the different campaigns that were being used with data for these e-commerce brands, the main cut through we were able to see was exploring consumer behavior. Um, this is where the data was putting in, not just looking at the relevance of the brand, but also digging into uh, the consumer behavior behind it. James, out of interest, do you have a, a view on why consumer behavior got so much better cut through? over other topics 
Yeah, I think the main thing is because it really taps into the key principles of what makes a digital PR campaign work for the media. So whenever we're working with a brand, we're always making sure that any stories that we put to them are hitting that sweet spot between relevance for the brand to be talking about it, but also creating those hard hitting headlines and being of interest to the media and more importantly, their readers, giving the journalists a reason to write it and getting an idea that fits in the middle of that little Venn diagram of relevance for the brand and going to be of interest for the media is the key for a successful digital PR campaign. So looking at your consumer's behavior is a really good way to tie into that. So we just wanted to show a couple of these uh, tactics in action. So this was a campaign that was run last year for Showers to You. So this was a survey campaign where it was asked, basically, UK nationals, how often do you wash your bathroom towels? And this was put out with splits of regions, gender, age, with a simple question of how often do you wash your towels? Uh, what are the main reasons why you would wash, wash your towels? And then um, this was combined with data from the Office of National Statistics to create population estimates. So here we have a campaign where the data is looking into an area around the bathroom. So it's instantly got that relevance to showers to you. It taps into their consumers because everyone uses a towel, or hopefully. And more importantly, it creates that hard hitting headline. So some of the data that came out from this was around sort of like a quarter of people wash their towel once a year and various other stats and pull down to different regions. And it really did grab the attention with that hard hitting headline, but had the relevance behind it as well. And this has performed really well, gaining 96 links to date from the BBC, which anyone who's worked in uh, media out, which will know is a very hard uh, publication to get a link from. Then your Daily Mails, your Mirrors, Express, Huffington Post, Lab Bible, most of the regionals and some global publications as well. And if I pass on to Emily, we can see how this had a direct impact on uh, the organic uh, performance as well. Yeah, so we, we actually worked together with the um, digital PR and SEO team to get this campaign out and make sure that we were going after the right types of publications. Um, and as you can see from the graph there, the campaign went live in September and very, very quickly after we started to see an increase in organic traffic. Um, they started to see ranking increases for a variety of both category, branded and measurement terms. Um, you can see that we actually broke on the first page for keywords such as shower trays, which were um, a primary focus keyword for showers to you. Um, what this graph doesn't actually show um, is that we actually re-ran the campaign again in December um, on organic traffic spiked again. So um, in the last kind of four or five months, we've managed to actually increase um, position page one keywords by 350 keywords. Um, so we've seen quite a monumental move up to that first page where the traffic is. So whilst we've got lots of amazing visibility and great links in, it has then had ROI on the SEO side as well. Similar. And another one we wanted to highlight was for a client called Jaw. So this just highlights that it is not just the UK media where this kind of activity can work. So uh, for the fashion experts Jaw, uh, we analysed search data to highlight which major fashion brands are most misspelt when consumers are searching for them. So again, you've got that instant breakthrough between the relevance of the brand on the fashion side, tapping into literally what the consumers are doing because they're the ones searching. And this was able to be put together as a ranking to be which fashion brands are misspelt the most. And this was able to tap into uh, some fantastic national, regional fashion and beauty publications, links from Vanity Fair, Harper's Bazaar, um, and Prima as well. So this is something where we can see that looking at the data, having the relevance um, as well, can really help you get that cut through when you're looking at your headlines. So if we were to put together some top tips for successful data-led campaigns, the first one to start with is always your ideation. You've always got to ensure your idea has topical relevance to your brand, but also has the potential for those media-friendly he headlines. James, and this is something sorry that, to interject. <laughs> just wanted to ask before you move on to the next point with regards to topical relevancy. I mean, you'll know from chats we have with clients every week that 
there's often an internal pressure to keep stories tightly relevant to the brand or the product. Um, but then on the flip side, as we know, you know, having those broader topics really is the, the sweet spot for digital PR in terms of cut through. So I just wonder what your advice would be, you know, to SEO managers, to, to marketing managers who have that internal struggle between wanting those broader topics for links, but being kind of pinned back maybe by their internal comms team. I think it's always an educational piece and that's where we always try to work with our agency, with our client partners and being able to pass on that message. So one thing that we will always do at the start of any ideation session is do a creative pillars document where we really dig into the brand and sometimes open their eyes to the areas that they can talk about and has that relevance. And then we can show how this directly links back to the areas that they're wanting to find growth in. Sometimes it's going to be a bit of a bend of a brand to be able to get yeah. the most reach. And that is client by client and part of the conversations and the partnership where you build up to be able to have those conversations that we can push something a little bit more out there in order to have that, but also match it with different activity that can highlight the uh, relevancy as well. So it's always a, it's never a one, one stop shop there's various different tactics that we can put in and it's all about having that blended approach. Makes sense. Perfect. So once you've kind of got your ideas all together and you want to be able to start proving the idea, you've got to gather the data. We're very lucky here at Reboot. We have a team of nine data scientists who do the legwork of pulling all the raw data for us and putting together some fantastic analysis sheets. But if working with the media, it's not just basically listing stats. You have to go through and find out which stats are going to be your key headlines, which are going to have the best story points. So really taking some time to delve into that and understand what story you're wanting to tell with the data is really key to having a successful digital PR campaign. And once you've done that, it's easy to make the di data as digestible as possible. So, you know, journalists will not have the time to delve into reams and reams of raw data. So we want to be able to present it to them in a way that's easy to see and sometimes even just be dropped into their articles. Utilizing graphics and data visualization is a really handy way of doing this just because it stop, it helps the journalists out, stops them having to find an image to put in their story. Um, and also including regional data, which is something that we push for all our data campaigns, increases the media reach so that we can start looking at targeted regional releases as well. The final uh, tip for data campaigns is something that tends to get missed every now and then, and it's just making sure all the data is transparent and accessible to journalists. Um, whilst they may not every time delve straight through, we need to be able to be showing that trust that the data is there for them to sense check if they want. Everything that we're saying isn't outlandish without some point behind it. And we can make sure that if requested, that data is there. So in terms of data-driven PR, that can be something that takes a bit of time to put together um, because you've got all the data analysis to put in. It's a wide range of people who might be interested in it. Another tactic that we saw in the white paper that was wildly used by uh, e-commerce brands was reactive PR. So reactive PR is something that kind of straddles the bridge between traditional PR and digital PR, where we're covering strategies that relate to offering insight to the trend in news cycle, aligns with the client's needs and goals and expertise. So when we analyze is the stats from the uh, white paper we found that reactive pr was adopted by 56 percent of the top e-commerce websites so it is something that is being utilized lots and this can be anything from offering comments to looking at trends within the uh, industry and basically targeting either a breaking news story with your top tier nationals or something much more in depth with your uh, current market and that will get you into your trade titles as well because there is that element of some trade titles that are brought in with this kind of activity, the average domain rating of the reactive PR link was slightly lower just because there's a much more relevant bank of links that are going to come through from those trade titles that whilst they may have a lower domain rating overall, the relevancy is there too. But then you also have the opportunity for the top tiers as well. I think that's um, that's particularly important from like an SEO perspective because as, as we know, it's something that Google will look at when it analyzes the backlink profile. 100%. Um, 
when we look at doing reactive PR, uh, we split this into two main types. So this is proactive and newsjacking. So there is sometimes an issue when we start talking about reactive PR with potential clients where they are concerned that they might not be able to have the internal time to turn things around very quickly. Some of the requests that come through from journalists may have a deadline of an hour, two hours. So speed is really key. But that doesn't mean it's not an activity that we can look to explore by being very proactive with the work that we do. So proactive uh, PR will be planned activity that centers around events where you create the story. So this can be looking ahead to things like Christmas, Halloween, planned sporting events like the Euros coming up this year and putting something that whether it be data, whether it be a comment, whether it be tips to the media directly from your client. And newsjacking is where we're reacting to something that's already happened. So the stories are already out there and we're going to be adding to them. And that's the easiest way to understand the difference. Proactive is where we'll be pushing something out where the tips that we provide will basically create the basis of the story and article that a journalist will write. Whereas newsjacking is something where they will utilize the insight as part of an article or even maybe a follow up article to something they've already written. So another couple of examples of the work that we've done uh, putting these into practice. So a proactive example is a client called Brainwork. So they are neurotherapy experts. And ahead of the autumn months coming in last year, we worked with their internal experts to put together tips on seasonal affective disorder. It's something that is consistently written about by the media as the nights start getting darker and everyone starts being annoyed that it's pitch black at four o'clock. So we just put together some really helpful tips in terms of explaining what it is and how best to be able to work around it if it does impact you. This was pitched out to national regional health publications and we're able to gain 27 links from places such as Wales Online and the other REACH um, publications, Reader's Digest, Country Living, and Ideal Home. And here you can see where, because we've been proactive and pitched it out as a tips-based format, the body of the article was basically the press release that we sent through and the tips involved in it. Looking at a more reactive example, um, last year, Taylor Swift was basically newsjacking dream. Anything that she did, whether it be going to NFL games or it was just such a high interest within the media. And when the Eras tour was announced for the UK, there was just article after article being written. So we worked with our uh, client partner, Seatpick, to put together some tips on how to best get uh, tickets, steps you need to take, and how to best avoid any ticket touts and things like that. So the important thing of this was we had to move quickly. So the client relationship is very important that we we're able to highlight why we needed to do this quickly. And their uh, advice that they were able to give to us was really helpful too. So this was put together and the important thing with this is you can see it's informative. It is about establishing authority and expertise in the space. It's not going down the ad route. It is just giving pure information. And the fact that it was this helpful, informative content is what drove it. We've been covered in 186 publications and the CPIC CEO is even featured on BBC Breakfast, giving advice on how to secure tickets and also just some general uh, updates on you know the ticketing market as a whole and how examples like this where tickets are so hard to get um could be looked at and changed in the future so really stamping the authority there uh not just through the links gained but also through the brand exposure as well james i wonder on reactive pr what your recommendations are for larger companies and seo managers inside more corporate businesses obviously the, the examples that we just walked through are great examples of, of reactive pr for links but they're smaller businesses perhaps with less internal you know pr and comms um you know professionals in in-house so i wonder you know again i've come up against it in the past where the bigger corporates will have a press office they'll be doing some element of reactive pr but perhaps not with that link building focus i wonder how you juggle that how you kind of encourage um, access to those ops with larger clients? Again, it's all about communication and building that partnership. Whenever we uh, work with a larger client like that and they have a press office, I'd always encourage us to be able to get a call in early doors just to see what's on their media plan, what are they looking to target, what are they focusing on, 
is there any gaps that we can help fill? Is there anything that means that the work that they're doing whilst gaining fantastic sort of like traditional PR benefits, is there anything that could be slightly adapted that could help build on a digital side as well? It might not be something that we're doing ourselves, but offering that insight and working in partnership with press mm -hmm. offices in order to make sure that everything is like ticking as much boxes as it can and getting you know as much uh, benefit from the work that may already been done or can be slightly altered to help out. Nice. Yeah, I guess as long as someone's got the links in mind, then that's the key. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. As long as it's coming through to the site and it's there. And that can even be very simple. I've worked with clients in the past where it's literally a matter of that press release you're sending out. You might want to include a link to your site in there mm -hmm. because sometimes it might not be thought of to done. And then instantly all the work that he's doing is not only having that traditional benefit, it's also having some digital benefit too. Awesome. So in this slide, we're just looking through just a few examples of trends we can hop on for reactive PR. And we kind of split that between the proactive and the news jacking. So if you are thinking of looking at starting up some uh, reactive PR activity, proactive things to keep an eye out throughout the year, any national awareness days, seasonal periods, as I mentioned, Christmas and Halloween, award ceremonies, like obviously with the Oscar nominations yesterday, that is a big thing in the press at the moment and sporting events, as I would mention, like the Euros, which will be a big uh, thing for sports media moving forward into the summer. Whereas newsjacking, got to be looking at current affairs. You've got film and TV releases that really, you can build up to these and be a bit proactive about it, but the time scale is very small, especially if you think about how things drop on Netflix these days, you don't even have the full run for some things. It's basically a week to get things out, so you've got to be quick. Celebrity news, such as engagements and weddings, the royals are always a really good thing to throw in here as well. And then, as I mentioned before, trade news. So whichever sort of like industry you are working in with a brand and then looking at the trade publications for that to build up the authority there too. So similar to the data-driven thing, we've just put a few tips on running successful reactive PR campaigns given uh, the work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So the number one, be quick. Um, journalists will be receiving hundreds and hundreds of emails regarding to breaking news stories. So the faster you can get in and the earlier you get in, the better. Um, a way to make sure you're ahead of things is to always be on the lookout for media requests. Look at tools such as Sponsource, Harrow, even um, journal requests on Twitter or X. And check recent news and social media see what people are talking about whether that be journalists that you've got a relationship with or know that they'll be putting out stories that are similar to the thing you are wanting to leverage or general um social media awareness to see what is trending at the moment key thing as well leverage your brand's expertise there's so much that brands will know and be experts in that can just be tooled and reworked in a press friendly manner um, as Sean mentioned before, sometimes there'll be press offices that are doing this already, other types of companies may not, so that's something that we can help build in there. But creating an internal process is going to be key with this, so that's whether you're looking at doing news jacking and you're setting up someone within the business that can respond to requests within, as I said, like an hour sometimes, maximum two, and whether that's either providing comments themselves or signing off pre-prepared comments, that is something that needs to be kind of aware that someone will be available to sign those off. However, there are a lot of companies and potentially um, regulated industries where that's just not going to be uh, possible due to the fact of the amount of sign off that will need to be put in place. And that's where you can start looking into more of the uh, planned in activity. So knowing that things are gonna be coming through and you can start building up that bank of expert comments ahead of time. So then they can be used during that season, but also if something breaks in the news that is linked into those, you can reuse them and repurpose them. So in summary of the two main types of activity that came through uh, from the analysis of the white paper, the data-led campaigns, uh, tended to be a higher quality of publications. Also, probably the number of links that came through from these was a lot higher just because the amount of data that's in there means you've got multiple story hooks, multiple angles, you can go out to a wider uh, batch of media. 
and making sure you're tapping into that consumer behavior can be really successful in ensuring you've got that relevance to the client, but also got that media interest. Whereas the reactive PR allows you to hop on trends in the news cycle. You can look through different things in terms of what's coming up in the year to jump on ahead and then just make sure that's a much quicker, but you can do more of this and just plan in your media calendar of what could be working for reactive PR through the year. So we've kind of gone through there, the types of activity and types of data that you can pull in or expertise you can leverage. But one of the key things that tends to get missed sometimes when talking about digital PR is the outreach process itself, which is one of the key factors and is really important to ensure that it's getting to the right people. You could have the greatest digital PR idea in the world. If it's not getting in front of the right journalists. It's not going to get the coverage it deserves. So it is something that we put a lot of emphasis on. So making sure that we're giving ample time to be able to outreach these ideas properly. To go through how that process works, and we'll go through a bit more detail in the following slides, it starts with planning the press release. Now, if you've gone through the steps that we were talking about earlier regarding making sure your data is sound, making sure you've got the relevance, making sure you've got your key findings and your story hooks, this should be relatively simple to go through because you know what the story is and you know the data to hang on it, or you know the tips and advice to hang on it if it's reactive. From that point, you can start prospecting your media list, utilizing media database tools, utilizing existing media contacts, um, if working with an agency, and being able to understand who you are going to be pitching this to. On that point, it's all about sending those outreach emails and making sure the eyes are getting on it. If you've not heard anything back, a bit of follow up and monitoring the response to your initial outreach emails. And then based on the activity as you go through, you may need to rework and look at pitch pivoting to a different uh, story hook. So as I mentioned in planning your press release, one of the key things here is lead with your key headline. This should also be your subject line when you're pitching this out, just because this is the main newsworthy stat that you thought was gonna interest media. So you grab that and you put that in straight away. Include your secondary story hook so they can add body to the article and make sure you're explaining your findings in simple and concise language. It can be really, sometimes you can get want to really sell the story in and use a lot of effusive language. It's not what journalists want to see. They want to see it simple, direct, and so they can understand what it is you're pitching, and then they can start writing up their article from that key data. As I mentioned about prospecting your media list, so we will tend to look at this between priority contacts and wider prospects. Priority contacts are the journalists that you know are gonna love your story. You've seen them write similar articles in the past. You know that it taps into things that they're interested in. So these are the ones of journalists and publications that we would target right from the bat and make sure that we're giving them ample time to see it, look at it before we widen out the scope of the outreach. And then your wider prospects should include a list of journalists and publications, maybe not expressed interest in those kind of stories, but you know from the other types of articles they've written, this would be a good fit for them, or it would be a good fit for the brand as well. One thing that does tend to sometimes get missed is your outreach email. So this is an addition to your press release, and this is where you're just giving a very simple breakdown of the key story points of the campaign. As you can see, a very quick example here. You keep it to the point, you keep it from the start, headline statistic, story hooks, and then further information is in the press release. Here's some images if you need it. It makes it really simple. Uh, anecdotally, I've heard from journalists in the past that if they would started reading your press release, you're about 75% there to getting them right in the article because they will be sold in on this initial email because they get so many emails through if they've opened it up from the subject line that's grabbed them, then they've seen your main hooks, then they can just go through. And a final thing that does tend to get missed on these include links to the brand homepage and any supporting blog pages. Sometimes it's just an easy thing to miss out, but if that's what we're looking to help drive that SEO growth and journalists will want to check the company who is send, you know, we're sending this on behalf of, it really helps just make sure we're covering both bases there. The next element is follow-up and monitoring. So when people first start working in media relations, this is something that does tend to um, 
create a bit of anxiety sometimes because people don't want to feel like they are annoying journalists or bothering them. But the information we've always had in terms of data we've seen on pickup and also feedback from journalists is that this is just a needed step when we are looking through in digital PR outreach, just because as mentioned before, journalists do get hundreds of emails in their inbox every day. They are having to filter through whilst writing articles and everything. So a very friendly, simple follow-up is an easy way to pop it at the back top of their inbox once again. And we've had feedback where saying, oh, really thanks for following up on this. We didn't see it the first time it came through. We'll write this up. And we can even see it in terms of when results start coming through on campaigns that we run. So an initial hit from the initial bit of outreach, but then it'll start picking up with the follow-ups. However, there is also the element of there is a fine line between following up to be helpful and spamming and uh, harassing journalists. So we would, as a rule of thumb, go a maximum three times. If you've not had anything from that point, then you need to go back and start looking at what it is in you are pitching out and maybe refine your story hooks to be able to go out with something fresh. And there's how we come into making sure we are conducting post-mortems for failed and successful campaigns, but also just as you're going through your uh, media outreach, if you can see something that is being picked up and it's working really well, you can pivot your uh, outreach to focusing on that point. Or if for some reason it's not picking up in the way that you thought, have another look at your press release. Where, what are your secondary story hooks? What can you expand out? What can you move a bit to the forefront? And making sure that you have a lot of information in there enables you to pivot quite quickly and start the process once again. James, we've had a couple of questions in this particular section about, um, you know, how long you should expect to see results. You know, what does good look like in terms of response rates and open rates and things? I wonder if you can touch on, on that in terms of what you normally aim for from that initial burst of outreach. From that initial burst of outreach, we'd expect to be seeing around, you know, a 30% 30 30 response. Even if that's not, yes, we love that, we'll take this, but something where someone's actually got back to us. Um, but to borrow an SEO phrase, it does depend. Um, it can be, you know, campaigns can sometimes take off from the instant you first send the first outreach email. Others, I've known we've been pitching and reworking for like six weeks and then it's flown because it is always an evolving process. So, but as long as you have developed your campaign with enough depth to it, enough story hooks that you can pivot, then things can uh, always be able to be turned around. Makes sense. I guess the, the benefit of those data intense pieces is exactly that. There's multiple angles, multiple areas to test. So yeah, no, yeah. That's, that's, that's great. Nice. Um, so just to, just to summarize everything that James has run through today, um, digital PR tactics are an effective way for e-commerce brands to develop their backlink profile. And um, one of the, the great things about digital PR is that you can build high authority, high relevant links at scale. You know, it's much more difficult to do that with some other link building strategies, um, which is probably why we're seeing it so widely adopted within the e-commerce space. And it's the strategy that we wanted to emphasize in this webinar, because if you are kind of, you know, a small or medium e-commerce brand looking to close the gaps on, you know, these, these massive, massive brands um, like eBay, Amazon, Argos, et cetera, you know, digital PR can be a really good way to accelerate growth as quickly as possible. Um, but it, it does have to be a blended approach of data led and reactive that allows you to get that SEO growth. You know, if, you, if you're only focusing on your data, you're potentially going to miss out on some of these quicker, more reactive opportunities that potentially will get you more relevant links. Um, so the, a blended approach is definitely kind of our recommendation where we've seen the most amount of success. Um, a personalized approach to outreach will always maximize coverage. I think James has already indicated that journalists are exceptionally busy and their inboxes get flooded on the daily. Um, so it's really important to make sure that you have a personalized approach and, and you're actually making sure that as you go through your prospecting, you know, that initial round that you're sending out is to relevant journalists that you do know that are gonna want to pick up on the story. You know, you're not you're not sending you know, a fashion story to someone, a journalist that writes finance, because um, then you're actually going to end up diminishing any relationship there. 
Um, and finally, you know, a digital PR strategy should work alongside your technical SEO and your content, um, because whilst you're driving the authority into the site, you then want to make sure that your site is in the best position possible to then be able to kind of leverage the power of the links and rank within the search results. Um, there's no point investing loads into digital PR um, if your site has technical SEO issues and can't be crawled by Google. Um, so kind of the three pronged <clears throat> of SEO uh, content and digital PR is definitely what would see uh, accelerated SEO growth the quickest. Awesome, guys. And then we'll the yeah, there's a few few good ones have come in so far. <laughs> I'm going to point a couple at James and a couple at Emily here. But um, one of our guests, Jane, asked, this is for James, possibly on the data side with research. But as an agency, you may well understand the data. Do you have calls with clients and do you talk them through those data sets and those data points for story? Yeah, and one of the key things that we do for that as well is a key findings document. So the data points in the story, even in the pitch stage, we will detail what we would hope to get from this kind of campaign, the headlines we'd hope to see. And then when sending through something for sign off, we will also do the key findings document that details, you know, so we did a survey of 3000 people, X percentage came back and said Y. And so we're detailing it nice and simple, and it can depend from client to client. We can talk through that on calls. We do that in some clients on bi-weekly calls to talk them through the data, or we'll uh, utilize email and be able to just ping through so they can see it nice and clear. Um, and the same way that we would put something nice and digestible for a journalist, it would be the same way we would uh, present it to a client. Nice. We've got Mark asking, what's the most common sources of data that you use for your digital PR campaigns? Oh, um, well, there's the go-to classic of surveys, but that is becoming less and less these days. Um, Office of National Statistics is an absolute gold mine. Um, we have, as mentioned, our in-house data team who pull together free data sources from various different government uh, places around the world. So when we're doing ideation, we tend to have a dig into those. Um, so Office of National Statistics, Statista is a good one to be able to see some data come through there. But any kind of government uh, police data is also can be good for things. So I think the my first part of call is always, what is the story that I'm wanting to do? And then type that into Google and add statistics. See what's already out there, see what is available. And then 99% of the time, the data scientists have to go and find it for me. <laughs> <laughs> So one for Emily, should people be building links to blog posts or their homepage? It's a great question. Um, I guess it does depend that the challenge with building links to your blog post, even if you're talking about a topic and you do have a blog post on it, is that you're essentially building the authority into a page where it's much more difficult to then pass it back through to your product pages. Even if you have a really strong internal linking strategy on those posts, you're probably not going to be linking to the majority of them. Whereas if you're passing the authority through to your homepage, typically you're then going to have links through to your key product categories and they're going to pass the authority on to the product pages. Um, so from, from a ranking perspective and authority perspective, you know, whilst it's great to have a variety of links to have that natural backlink profile, you know, we would recommend having them on the homepage as opposed to blog posts. Totally. Yeah, I guess we can circulate the uh, on by case study after the, the webinar as well. Really good example of that kind of strategy targeting either the home page or product pages, the money pages with those links directly and yeah, driving that growth against competitors. Yeah, one of the great things about digital PR is it, it can be easier than other link strategies to get links to the product pages themselves. Um, so that's always, you know, the priority would be them from an SEO perspective because you're going to improve your rankings. Um, obviously, some publications will want to link to the homepage with a brand mention. That's fine. Um, I think as long as you're yeah being clever with your with your strategy to make sure you're getting a diverse mm -hmm. amount of links. Um, that way, yeah, it's, it's going to be natural and not not have any issues there. Um, but hopefully that's answered the question. And uh, will digital PR work for me if I'm in a boring industry? <laughs> I <I'm gonna> ask <laughs> that quite quite regularly. <laughs> Yes, I think digital PR can be utilised for any type of industry. Um, it depends on the tactics that you want to employ. So a so-called boring industry can work really well with your active PR because we could delve really into 
the expertise for that industry. But also, if there is the ability to kind of widen the scope, as I mentioned before, with the creative pillars and look at things that are going to be adding to, you know, the consumer relevance, but stretch it a bit, there's so much we can do. I've in the past, I've worked with the roofing merchants um, and we guessed the well, we analyzed how much it would cost to make all the different Star Wars vehicles in real life. So a bit of a weird stretch because there was buildings as well. In there. But um, that was the link. But yeah, there's there's plenty of different things and it all comes down to the initial uh, media audits, client audits and working with uh, the client in, in their industry to find the best tactics that work. Totally. So we'll take one more. So Terry May is asking, are there any resources that you'd recommend to gain those industry specific mailing lists or those broader mailing lists, or is that where the PR agency comes in? <laughs> Answer this question. Huh? Um, <laughs> there are there are numerous different um, database tools. Uh, we use a fair few um, ones to, in the past are you know Rocks Hill, Gorkana, everything like that. But it's one thing having a mailing list and being able to just ping out a press release to um, all the different people on that media list. It's where the prospecting comes in to know who to contact, who's the best person for that specific campaign or that specific story. And yeah, I'd say that's where the PR company comes in. Awesome. We've got time for probably one more. So we've just, yeah, there's a lot flying in here, which is great. Thank you guys for getting so engaged. So we've got uh, yeah, a question around content assets, really. So do you find any particular resonance with regard to creative formats? Is there a role for video or UGC or more traditional graphics? For, for your outreach assets? In terms of the outreach assets, video can be really useful, especially uh, if you're going after regionals, they tend to use a lot of videos at the top of their uh, articles. But as long as you're offering something that's going to help the journalist, I think, and it depends on the story itself, if it's something that requires the video, it should never be a one size fits all for any kind of story. So if it's something where we're looking at, say, the UK towel piece. If you were looking at the regional stats on there, a simple heat map of the UK would be absolutely fine to properly show that story. Whereas if it was something a lot more in-depth uh, that required some video, then you can utilise that. But it should always be led by the story in terms of uh, what goes with it. Thanks, James. I think that, yeah concludes our session today guys um, the time has flown by but yeah no thank you again to everyone who joined uh, loads of good engagement and questions um, there's a few more that we'll be able to follow up with perhaps after the session uh, and we're saying the webinar will be available to watch back uh, on our website on youtube etc and linkedin so if you'd like to review any of the key points that we've gone through or share any of the you know the, the nuggets with the colleagues feel free to do so um we're saying you know naturally probably well a lot of a lot of points raised today might pose more questions or fresh ideas for you guys you know who are planning your 2024 digital pr and offsite seo strategies obviously we've talked a lot about the use of data um and it's a, it is a big hurdle you know no doubt the clients that we speak to every week um it's one of the areas that is tough to scale in-house in for sure you know reboots approach has been to go go full steam with that we've built a team of nine data scientists in house and you know they're powering our pr stories constantly with genuinely unique data sets helping us get that cut through with journalists but yeah we'd welcome you know any conversations to pick up after this session if anyone is exploring fresh creativity or you know how they can actually scale you know that data-led approach to digital pr we'd be more than happy to connect and you know talk about your challenges those goals or just offer advice really in terms of how to scale that strategy um, but yeah, all I can say is thanks again. So, you know, it's been great um, the the second instalment, and yeah, we'll be uh, sharing details about future events and, and upcoming webinars uh, in the very near future. So yeah, thank you again, guys. Yep. See you all later. Bye. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>